I'm Jane Hansen. This week in the arena, the devastation in Haiti. It was just over a month ago that an earthquake ravaged the small country in the Caribbean. Death toll estimates are over 200,000, and millions more have been left injured or homeless. Is enough being done now to help the Haitian population, and what obstacles are preventing them from recovering? Joining us, Monsignor Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn. Seth Golby, Director of Planning and External Relations for the American Red Cross in Greater New York. And Father Miguel, Pastor of St. Jerome's here in Brooklyn, who was in Haiti when the earthquake hit. Let's start right with you. As I understand it, you just arrived. You're in the basement of your family home in uh, Port-au-Prince. Can you describe it, what happened? I got to Haiti, it was uh, 1.30. But I went to Haiti specifically to meet with uh, the late Archbishop of Port-au-Prince, Monsignor Mio, who was killed that day. And I called him, I said, Bishop, I'm in Haiti, I'm in town. And he said to me, come to see me around five o'clock, but wait for my call before you come. Otherwise, I would have been there at 4.30, waiting for him in his <sighs> office. But 4.30, I got a call from him, and I said, you can come now. So I got up, because I was in the living room, I got up, went to the, to just watch my face and get ready to go and see the Archbishop of Fort Prince when uh, we got the first uh, uh, hit from uh, the earthquake, and that was terrible. And I was there in the basement, uh, it was a, it's a building of four stories, and, uh, and I heard uh, uh, the first, the second and the third uh, floor uh, collapse, boom! And, 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 uh, and uh, in a second, in a matter of 30, 33 seconds, the whole house was destroyed, and uh, thank God we were in the basement. This is how we, 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 we were saved. Because the people who were on the other floors above you were all killed in, or, or, you know, and, and you clawed your way out. Yeah. yeah. You and other members of your family. Yeah. How long did it take? Um, maybe um, f uh, three or five minutes, because we, I was, um, all I put, first thing I, 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 I did, I took a chair, and I, I and kept uh, uh, hitting the, the, the wall, and then I got uh, enough space to get them out first and to get out. But the people above me, all, all of them uh, was killed. They were killed. And then as time went on over the next few minutes, hours, days, you saw this horrific process of A, trying to rescue people and B, trying to help those who were alive. Yeah, so um, I spent the night uh, in Port-au-Prince, uh, just like everybody else on the street. Uh, early in the morning at 3.30, I decided to go to my town, which is uh, 60 miles from Bodopens, Petit Guave. Uh, it was unbelievable. Uh, dead bodies everywhere on the road. And, and sometimes I have to get out, we or asking my nephew to get out and to move the bodies aside so that we can proceed. And, um, uh, and at at uh, a place by the name of uh, Martis, and there was a, a boy, seven, eight years old, he was on the road, and I thought that he was dead, so I got out and, and tried to, re to move his body, and when he, 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 he I, I heard him say, ah, so I, I, just touching him hurt him, and, and, oh. and I look at him, and I saw that he wasn't dead, and so I move him aside, got back to my car and about to leave. Then came to my mind the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. That, 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 that came to my mind, that's I say. And I've been preaching about the, 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 the parable of the Good Samaritan. That was the opportunity. So I got off again and went to him and, and took him in my car. But when I, when, I, when I took him, I took him in pieces because his leg broken and he, he's, uh, uh, he's behind uh, almost um, uh, coming down. And I have to take off my, my shirt and I, I bend everything. Uh, he's behind and I took him to my town and I took him to the hospital. And with him, uh, uh, with the Red Cross, you, you, you do represent uh, the Red Cross from Switzerland. They came to my town and they rescued him and they took him to Switzerland. Now, I hope that he will survive. It must be just 
chilling for you, Seth, working with the Red Cross, to hear this kind of a story of somebody who lived through that and knowing what the work you're doing has brought to them? What? It, it is, and, and it makes me uh, grateful once again to be able to be in a position with an organization like the Red Cross. Uh, it's really notable that uh, the Haitian Red Cross, which we feared initially was going to have been devastated by this, has been enormously successful. 7,500 volunteers working in Port-au-Prince and the area around it, 10,000 volunteers throughout the country for the Haitian Red Cross alone. 30 other countries have also sent delegations to, to, uh, to Haiti. Um, and, and the international support has been just outstanding. Compare that to 14 nations that sent Red Cross delegations for the response to the tsunami a couple of years ago. So it's been an enormous response. We're so proud of our Red Cross brothers and sisters in Haiti. Uh, they're doing such a fantastic job. Father, I'm wondering, as we're sitting here talking, I mean, you, you, just, you just talked about the Good Samaritan, and I'm thinking how hard it must have been to see this happening to your family and your country and to think about how do you, how do you deal with why did this happen and that whole concept of this God punishing us. Uh, we, we knew that uh, uh, Haiti could be uh, hit at any time by an earthquake. Unfortunately, uh, nobody did anything to get ready and prepared for that. So, uh, I'm very grateful to the uh, international community. I'm very grateful to the United States. But you know something that people need to know is more life could have been saved if we had the proper response after the earthquake. What is that We mean? are, uh, Haiti is um, one hour, 30 minutes from Florida. And the United States government sent the Marines to Haiti uh, early in the morning on Wednesday. They were already in our airport. But they didn't come to rescue people. They went there to rescue only American citizens. So you're and saying? They did, they, the only American citizens and the French government who are 24 uh, hours from Haiti, sent firefighters, people who know how to save people who were under the concrete. Yes. And they sent them with the machineries to do that. They were prevented of landing in Haiti because the American Marines will not then get in they had first to rescue the American citizens. There was a big, like a mixed feeling between that, be, uh, he, among the Haitian people uh, regarding that action. Because for me, what was the most important thing was to save life, any kind of life, not to make a distinction that day uh, between the Haitian and the American citizens. That was a terrible thing to do, and, and, and this is why a lot of people die not on Tuesday, they die on Wednesday, on Thursday, Friday, under the concrete because there was no help, no one to rescue them. That's a pretty uh, difficult thought to deal with. How, how do that, we... That is very painful because I'm thinking about, for instance, Monsignor Benoit, who was one of the uh, uh, vicar generals of the Archdiocese Arch of port au he, we could hear his voice on Tuesday evening. He was crying, yelling, asking for help. Wednesday he was still under the concrete. No help came. Thursday, it was only on Thursday evening they didn't hear his voice. They got his body on Friday at 2 p.m. and his body was still warm, but he was dead. That means probably he died uh, early in, uh, in the morning on, on Friday. After September 11th, uh, you know, the churches in, here in New York were open and people were coming and all over, you know, trying to make sense of what has happened. Uh, in, in Haiti, uh, everyone's lives was affected. It wasn't just 3,000 people in a building. It was everyone's lives were affected in terms of the physical destruction. Uh, how, uh, how do people come to grips with evil and the evil, natural evil in the world and, and their faith. Faith came 
became stronger because you see people now uh, praying and the Protestant people who are talking to the Catholic people coming together to pray together and to help each other. It's unbelievable yeah. the kind of solidarity that I see among the people. Do you think that there is a, an underlying anger, though, about the kinds of statements that you're just making? Are there people who are questioning the help? Oh, yeah. Because uh, uh, after um, taking care of the American citizens, and uh, the American Americans uh, moved to bring uh, beans and rice to the people, when we still had people under the concrete asking uh, for help to be, to be saved, Nothing was done. And I even myself, I went to one of the uh, uh, Marines uh, commander and I, I said, you need to do something. He said to me, we don't have other to do that. We're here to, uh, to rescue and to uh, evacuate the American citizens. Right. I do recall, though, and Seth, maybe you can, can, can voice this for us, that there was a lot of confusion and there was a, because of all of the destruction, it was really difficult to get things in place for rescue operations, for the food, for the shelter, for, for aid, for, for everything. I mean, do you, when you're listening to Father Miguel speaking, I'm sure there must be a lot of mixed emotions going through you. The, uh, in any kind of disaster, and, and I've been to quite a few, um, the initial days are very chaotic. Um, one of the problems, uh, with getting heavy equipment in uh, to do excavation work was that uh, the airport had to be certified as, as being that, that the runway wasn't damaged. Even when the airport was reopened, you could only park five, six, seven airplanes at a time. It's not like JFK. The pier at the seaport was completely broken up and it was two and a half weeks, I think, before they could start offloading ships there. And, uh, they're still in the process of repairing that pier. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, is, is the right assistance there at the right time? Frequently not. Uh, frequently not. And uh, to a great extent, um, it's a question of, of having to rebuild infrastructure before you can bring in the proper equipment. It's really no e excuse. And uh, I've had uh, I've had members of the Haitian clergy here in New York City say to me, you know, we have to teach our, our communities uh, the skills of uh, uh, preparedness and uh, first aid and, and light urban search and rescue so that, uh, so that we don't have to depend on the authorities. This is a, a lesson actually that was learned in Los Angeles quite some time ago, again in the context of earthquakes, that the authorities and the equipment might be prevented from getting to any particular place and it, uh, it caused the creation of, of citizen teams that, that can do response and, and uh, search and rescue. Understood. We're going to take a break for just a moment to continue this conversation. When we do, we'll be joined on the phone by a member of Catholic Relief Services. So stay with us. Welcome back as we continue our discussion on the crisis in Haiti. Joining us now on the telephone is Maria Barbosa from Catholic Relief Services. Hi, Maria. Hello, Jane. How are you doing? Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for joining us. Let's talk a little bit about what Catholic Relief Services is doing on this day in Haiti. I know they've been there for 50 plus years. Obviously, the earthquake uh, demanded a lot more of your services. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing there now and what you guys see on the ground? Sure. Um, well, as you mentioned, we have been there for a long time, so we um, and have been working hand-in-hand -hand with the Catholic Church in Haiti um, on a number of projects. So it was, um, we were very much able to right away respond um, and get the support that was needed. Um, we are uh, providing, uh, up to today, we've provided over half a million um, rations, food rations for people that needed it. We are also um, making sure they have water, that, it's, um, that they have uh, latrines, that they have... Can we um, talk a little bit, Maria, about what mm -hmm. the long-term... Yeah. Just talk about what it is that, they're, that they 
they need now that they may not have or what you see need, needs for long term? Well, uh, the needs in Haiti are incredibly great because it's a country that is a population that was very vulnerable before the earthquake. This is the poorest country in our hemisphere. So the needs have just been completely exacerbated with the earthquake. Um, Let's see, Harrington, just uh, on a concrete level, like what exactly is Catholic Relief Services doing for the long term? Are you involved in agricultural development or, uh, or infrastructure uh, rebuilding? How, how is that working? How are you? I know that uh, each of the parishes throughout uh, the country have been taking up collections for Haiti. And I guess uh, how are you going to allocate those resources for immediate needs versus the long term needs of rebuilding uh, the country? That's an excellent question. We have been working all along in development goals. So we have been working to help farmers do better farming, um, providing small loans, providing health to uh, care for mothers and small children. So that has been going all along. We have a, a really deep presence on the ground. We have an area in Port-au-Prince, a, a golf field that has become a camp for 50,000 people that we're providing education for, we're providing um, water, food, so the basic needs and um, shelter right now is a huge need because of the rains that are coming. So we are, um, and they've been incredibly creative. Haitians have, um, are very resilient and hands-on, and they've been um, make you know, with this simple material that we're providing, they're making this um, great compound so they can have um, a family takes over uh, um, one of the rooms and and Maria one of the uh, one of the things that's been very much in the press lately has been the uh, the uh, US missionaries who were uh, taking children out of the country uh, bringing them back to the United States uh, and uh, charges of kidnapping and of course you know that a number of those uh, missionaries have been let go although the leader is still in prison uh, I guess the question is is uh, do you anticipate that uh, Catholic Relief Services will be facilitating adoption services for children in Haiti who uh, might have uh, lost parents, loved ones who are not going to have uh, the need, their uh, basic material needs met. And, and if so, how are you going to do that in the midst of this kind of situation? Right. We have been providing protection for orphans um, before the earthquake. We provided, supported over 100 orphanages. And right now we're focusing on making sure that those children are uh, fed, that they have um, trauma counseling, and we're trying to place them first with uh, relatives and extended families uh, because we believe that it's important that they are uh, cared for in their own communities at this moment. Um, there, it's, unfortunately, the disasters is a time when children are extremely vulnerable and they could be trafficked. So. Um, it's important to keep them within their families and uh, very protected. All right, thank you, Maria. Seth, I guess one of the things Maria just brought up is talking about the rainy season is coming in April. There's a lot of concern about how are we gonna make sure that, th that there's crops planted in March. You're working on that. Well, uh, we're working on the, on the shelter part of it. Uh, the two big concerns uh, uh, that we have uh, one is sanitation because so much of the infrastructure was damaged with the hospitals uh, in, in a building, rebuilding phase. Uh, sanitation hygiene, incredibly important, can't work on that fast enough. The second thing is, as, as you noted, the, the rainy season is coming, folks need shelter. And um, we're, as far as I know, you know, things are being moved in very, very quickly, but so many people have been displaced. Um, even the ones who have been able to find shelter with family members in other parts of the country have created overcrowding problems there. Now, the government has apparently selected four locations where, where temporary cities will be erected, but it remains to be seen how that's going to be done uh, in the amount of time. But Especially there, when you have a government that hasn't really been functioning because the government, for whatever it was, was also decimated. Father yeah. Miguel, what do you see from your family and from your own eyes? Because I know you just came back. What do you see as, as things that need to be taken care of and that maybe need to be addressed that aren't being addressed yet? We have a lot of organization coming to help Haiti. But it is not really in their interest to build a long-term uh, plan. Because if in the day the Haitian people will be able to take care of themselves, 
there will be no justification to be, for them to be in Haiti. Okay. Meaning that there is no organization who are thinking about long-term plan. They are providing immediate help, yeah. emergency help. Yes. Rice and beans and water. And as long as they can provide wines and beans and water, that is okay. They need to talk with the Haitian people. They need to talk to the local leaders. And they need to get the local leaders on board. So that the local leaders of the towns who have been hit by the earthquake can, with them, make a plan, a long-term plan, so that one day the Haitian people will be able to take care of themselves. And then, no, just exactly. A, uh, just a, 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 you know, you hear stories of mass graves. Uh, we're hearing about stories of sanitation in terms of how, how is the very real need to care with reverence, dignity for, for bodies, and, 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 and the church, 40% of the church has been decimated in, uh, in Haiti as well. I think something like 60 priests to, and bishops in Haiti have been killed. H how are those spiritual needs going to be addressed to bury people, to make sure people are being anointed, to hear confessions? H how is that happening? I, I, I was there, yeah. and I got to my town on Wednesday around uh, 430 and I went to the hospital because I had that kid with me. So I brought that kid to the hospital, that boy. And then I went to see the pastor of my town because from uh, people I got that my church, the church that I was baptized, where I was baptized, where I made first communion, where I was confirmed, and where I went to see my first mass in Haiti after my ordination was totally destroyed. Just didn't exist anymore. So I went to see him and I said, Father, there is a need. Because by tomorrow, they're going to dig um, uh, uh, and, and say they want to bury the people. So we need to go to the cemetery and, and to bless the bodies and, and to have a service. So he said to me, Father Miguel, uh, it's not over yet and I'm, leaving, I'm not leaving where I am. If you want to do so, you can do so. Mm. From Wednesday to Saturday, every single day, from 5 in the morning, to four or five in the afternoon, I went to the cemetery just to have services and to just sprinkle holy water, not on bodies, on parts of bodies. Mm. I didn't see people, I didn't, see, I didn't recognize anyone. Okay. I saw legs, uh, 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 heads, uh, and stomachs. Uh, it's, it, it, it's not something that I want people to see and to experience. And it was the second day that he came, he joined me, and we were all there together, praying, singing, crying with the people. But there, our presence said a lot to the people and meant a lot to the people. Uh, let me tell you something. I've been a priest for a long time, but now I know something about faith. Your faith, really, it's what gives you strength to continue. To get up and to say, I'm going to give up and I'm going to continue in the name of God, in the name of Jesus. I've never seen myself, I never thought of doing that because I never thought that I would have to experience such a, a disaster. But that moment, I really understood what being a priest was all about. It wasn't about a rectory. It wasn't about food, it wasn't about uh, drink, it wasn't about uh, a, 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 a good uh, a bed to sleep. It was about the people, their needs, and to be Jesus for them, and to bring them hope and consolation. Hope and consolation. You embrace the people, you kiss them, you dare, you pray with them, and people will never forget that. Father Miguel, I will never forget this experience of meeting you. Thank you for sharing this with us today. It's an amazing story. Thank you, Seth. Colby, we appreciate you. And Father Harrington, you'll be right back. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment.
Welcome back. Continuing our conversation now on the crisis in Haiti, we are joined by our show's regular contributors, Elizabeth Scalia, author of the blog The Anchoress, and Grant Galicho, associate editor of Commonweal Magazine. So one thing we didn't address earlier in an earlier discussion was all of the scams that are going on, that it always seems like whenever there's some kind of a crisis or a catastrophe, in the end, there are people who are out there trying to make money off of it. How do you deal with it? What do we know about it? How do we feel? Uh, well, actually, the uh, Better Business Bureau has a website where you can, you can go in and, and see whether the email solicitations you've received are uh, legit. And there, there are some basic rules. If, um, if the name of the outfit asking you for money sounds like one of the others that you've heard of, like, you know, the red... Red Cross Light or something. <laughs> then don't don't send the money if they if they ask for cash. Don't don't send money. Um, if you if if they phone you and you tell them that you want to give X amount and then they ask for more, um, that's probably uh, that's probably a fake group. People are trying to where they're trying to scam individuals now is is people here in Haiti who are trying to bring family members over. People who have questionable legal status here are seeking to get their legal status regularized. And one thing, at least in, in, in our diocese, we're for sure a Catholic Migration Office provides a good service uh, for people. I think it's about $500 to fill out all the paperwork and take it for a temporary protective uh, status. And, and hopefully the government will uh, really make a priority in seeking to help move a lot of those people who are in that pipeline through the process. It's, What's that called again? Catholic Migration Services? Catholic Migration Office, yeah. Okay. I mean, in Brooklyn and Queens, uh, there are a lot of reputable, in, uh, a lot of reputable institutions looking to help people. So you shouldn't, people shouldn't be scared off because there are scam artists out there. The question is, is really they have got to go to the people what's they can the trust. Truth? Hi, what's That's the it. truth? What's reality? What's real? That's what's it. not? Some of the other, uh, some other events that are surrounding this whole Haiti issue, of course, the missionaries and the adoption and our kids being kidnapped or are they really legitimately being moved from Haiti to much better lives? So how, how are we supposed to take all of that? Because it seems like there's some pretty good intentions. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I Honestly, I think Grant has a lot more background and is better read on the, the well-intended missionaries who um, got themselves in all kinds of trouble there. Yeah, it's, um, it was a group uh, from Idaho, uh, from a couple of Baptist churches there, and uh, they decided to uh, travel to Haiti to pick up um, orphan children and uh, take them to the Dominican. And unfortunately, they didn't, it doesn't seem that they had the proper documentation. Uh, so when they got to Haiti and started picking up kids, uh, many of whom had living families, still have living parents, uh, gra grandparents, uncles, aunts, um, uh, they, were, they were taken into custody by the Haitian authorities and jailed. And uh, it's a very complicated story. It seems that one of the lawyers who volunteered to help them um, had, it was wanted by the uh, U.S. government for uh, human trafficking. What's fascinating is when you look at this whole situation, you take a look at there's a natural disaster, you see uh, sometimes the worst in people coming out, some, some, sometimes the worst in, in a few people who are on the ground in Haiti, you know, yelling, yelling that there's a flood coming and trying to steal, and at the same time there's great heroism in it. And I guess the question for us as Christians is, is to look at it and say, where's God in all of this? Is there God in the midst of the circumstances? where people are trying to get over on one another, uh, where there's natural disaster, and at the same time, great acts of heroism. Good and evil always coexist very closely to each other. And um, in Haiti or any disaster, you'll see the people who want to exploit it and the people who want to serve. Um, I, I think that the, the question of where was God in all of this is that God was everywhere. God was in all of the people who were going out, you know, going out. God was in my son, who, you know, has absolutely nothing to offer the people of Haiti, who wanted to jump on a plane and go help them, even if, even if it meant removing rubble with his bare hands. Um, and I, I think that you need to look sometimes for God, because it all seems so devastating and so overwhelming. But I was talking to a missionary. I wasn't talking to I was communicating with a missionary in uh, a town called uh, Tiguav, about 30 miles out of Port-au-Prince, and um, he has sent pictures my way, and he's told stories about, uh, for example, a little girl named Marie Claude, who was four days under the rubble and assumed gone. And um, people started using pickaxes to get at 
you know, clearing the rubble because roads were, were blocked and so forth. And um, a pickaxe actually came down on Marie Claude's head and, and hurt her down to the, the skull bone. And her screams alerted them to the fact that, no, she wasn't dead. She was in there. And then they were able to rescue her. And she's actually done very well in a very short time. She had immediate medical help because, again, volunteers and people were there um, being God for each other. And so to your point, God is everywhere. We are out of time, but we will continue this discussion, I'm sure, at another moment. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Monsignor. Good to be here. And thank all of you for being with us. And remember that you don't need a TV to watch the net. We are always online at www.netny.net. For all of us here, I'm Jane Hansen. I'll see you next time in the arena.